I was going to men mention, it's good to see Cameron uh, back with us today and um, little baby Bailey. It's good to see both of them. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about um, if all of humanity could hear one sermon. Uh, in, prepar in preparation for the lesson, I started thinking about uh, what if I was given an opportunity as a preacher uh, to speak to all the people on planet Earth at one time in one sermon? Uh, what would I say? What would I talk about? Uh, you know, the Earth as of 2024 has roughly 8 billion people living on it. What if every country, village, and tribe set up a teleprompter, a movie screen, and allowed uh, maybe all their members to have access to it if they had phones, and everybody could listen to a sermon? Uh, what if a preacher was given 30, 40 minutes? Uh, maybe an hour would be nice uh, if, if, if that's all we were going to get is one message. But what, if, if that message could be translated and understood into all the languages of the earth, my question this morning is what would the preacher say uh, to make the best use of one message to all of mankind? I thought that might be a neat idea to, to do this morning. I suppose you could say this would be an efficient way of preaching the gospel to every creature. Uh, fulfilling the Great Commission. You do it all at one time. That'd be awesome. Uh, Mark 16, 15 to 16, Jesus gave us the Great Commission, his parting words. Uh, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. Uh, so the neat part about this idea is that Jesus already told us what we would need to say in this sermon. So we need to have that as the backbone and we're going to preach the gospel um, and what's the outcome? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He told us what the outcome would be. Yeah, so it really is a simple message, it's a simple response. But I started thinking to myself, uh, if, if I got really if such a neat, if such a neat scenario existed and, and a preacher got such an opportunity, you know, if he, if he could spend 35, 40 minutes on a lesson to preach to the world, you know, how would I try to break down this incredible message into one lesson and of course, you know, I could write this same sermon probably 10 different times and it would come out slightly differently. You'd still be preaching the gospel. I'd like to hear Ben do this sermon. I'd like to hear Jake and others do this sermon. It, it would turn out great. But um, how I did it this morning, you know, mankind likes working in increments of 10. So I broke down 10 points for this. Uh, I'm sure that the whole world would appreciate a, a list of 10 things that they can work on. And by the way, I would plead with every listener uh, at the beginning of such a message, hey, before you hear these 10 points, know with certainty that you need to dig into these points further on your own. Uh, after the message is over, do it like your life depends on it. Uh, don't just hear this message in the sermon one time and forget about it and be done with it. Instead, hear this message and make it your life. And that's what we're asking you to do. So study the message, put this message in your heart, feed on this message, make it your daily spiritual bread and, and keep feasting on it. And commit these things to memory. Uh, so here's how I broke it down. Of course, different ways of breaking this, this, this awesome message down. Here's how I did it. Point number one, I would start here with the world. You, number one, are a creation. You are the creation of an all-powerful God who cares for you. Uh, written in the Bible, God's word to humans starts out relaying to us this truth where we came from. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Relayed to us plainly in scripture is the true God uh, who created heaven and earth. I'll add this, the only God. And this would be a, a stressor in this message to the whole world. There are a lot of people who don't know the true God. Um, you know, a lot of times we take that for granted being in, in America. Most people know of, you know, quote, the, the God of the Bible. But you go elsewhere in this world and, and they, they, some people don't really, uh, they don't adhere to this or they've not heard it. So if you, if you go through God's word and study the concept of who God really is, you will quickly learn of the truth of what some call the Trinity. Uh, more biblically, it's called the Godhead or they're called the Godhead. The God who created the universe is comprised of uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three separate and distinct individuals with the same power, might, and nature. Uh, the Godhead has communicated to us uh, that it is they who are responsible for the existence and home that we have here on the earth. They're responsible. 
They have also relayed to us that it is God the Father whose plan is being followed, by the way. And the other two are submitting to this plan, uh, though they are equal to the Father. It was the Father who thought of the plan to create heaven and earth in the first place. Colossians 1 and verse 16 and his two equals have gone along with this plan uh, and their parts in the role with humanity and in, in, in this great scheme of redemption so from the very beginning. They're following the Father's plan. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, we uh, see clearly our origin as the Godhead's creation from the mind of the Father administered by the Godhead. So then God said, let us make man in our image. You see the communication of the Godhead. Let's make man in our image according to our likeness, and let mankind have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And this is an important message, you know, against atheism, knowing that you're not just a primate. You are higher than the animals. God made each individual here higher than the animals, and we are made in the image of God. Verse 27 says, so God created mankind, this species, uh, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So uh, we all came forth from the living God, the Godhead. God had communicated amongst themselves in the very beginning, let's make man in our image. Uh, in the image of the Godhead, <laughs> human beings were created. Elsewhere in scripture, we learn that this means that we were made as spirits, spirit beings, just like the Godhead are spirits three in particular, uh, we are spirits and we're dwelling inside a physical shell, a body, but the inner man, that's what's made in the image of God. So of course, we, the creation, are not all powerful. We're not all knowing like the spirits of the Godhead, but we are made like them in the sense that we are spirits too. We're the same type of thing as them, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. They are spirits who created more spirits. Uh, the New Testament calls God the, the father of spirits. So that, that's all human beings are. And that's where you came from. That's what you are. Spirits created in the image of God. You're dwelling in a body. So when the God, God had created you, they created a spirit that, like them, will never cease to exist. Okay, that's impo important. An immortal being. A timeless being. Uh, and after you were created... Such is the case that you will now exist forever and forever and forever. Not your flesh, right? Not, not this shell, but the inner man that was made in the image of God will exist forever and ever. I think if everybody could get that, they would understand how important this whole message is. After uh, your time on the earth has ended, you will not cease to exist once you leave the current body. The spirit of man is immortal in the fashion similar to God. No, we are made as spirits like God, immortal beings. Uh, some people act like dying is just the end, and that, that's all there is. Uh, but our Creator has assured us that death is not the end. Uh, death is only the passageway into the longest section of man's existence, and that is called eternity in the Bible. And death is only the beginning of that. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in their hearts except that no one can find out the work of, that God does from beginning to end. So you can search this out and, and try, try, you know, look into the scheme of the Father's plan and all this. You're not going to find it out entirely. You'll get what He's given to us. But one thing He has put in our hearts is eternity. Mankind knows, I believe innately, that eternity is just on the other side of the borders of this life. And we know it's there. Uh, and we will exist eternally and, and not die. God has put this uh, understanding in our hearts, and we know with certainty that we will exist forever and ever. Humans know that. Uh, so point number one, where did we come from? How did we get here? Uh, we came forth from the creation of an all-powerful, all-knowing God. And this is something we'll talk about later in the lesson, but this God tremendously cares for us. He really wants what's best for us, and, and, and He wants to be with us. Point number two, how about this? Earth is your testing ground. Uh, some of us wonder, well, why did God put us here? What was the point? But God has shown us plainly that the purpose of our time on earth is to test human beings. It's a testing place. 
Uh, this wasn't meant to be your eternal place. It's, it's, it's the place where you're tested to see if you will pursue the living God and trust in him or not. Uh, so trust in God while you're here, you can pass this test. Job said uh, to God in Job chapter 7 and verse 17, What is man? What is mankind? That you exalt him. We're above the fish of the sea, the birds of the air. That you should set your heart on him. Why are you paying attention to us and looking on mankind? That you should visit him every morning and test him every moment. How long? Make no mistake about this. Uh, you your entire life is a test, okay? He didn't mean for it to be a miserable thing. There, are, there is enjoyment along the way during the test. God blesses us. He shows us his blessings. But in essence, this is a test. Okay? You're being tested. That God is going to examine this test at the end of uh, your existence, so whether or not you, if you want to put it this way, pass or fail. Uh, that's something I, I would make sure that every human being is made aware of is, is the judgment it will come upon you as an individual person. What is life? Life is a, is a test administered by God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 shows us the end of this test when it will come to the forefront and we'll, we'll be judged according to our lives. It says, for we must all appear, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one, each individual, may receive the things they did in the body while they lived according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Uh, Revelation 20 and verse 13 gives this further prophecy. And they were judged, each one according to his works. So does the Bible say that humans will give an account for the way that they lived their lives while they're here on the earth? That's essentially exactly what it said. So the God who created you is watching the way you live your life. And in some fashion. So that's what he's relayed to us. We're, going to be te we're being tested. He's watching. And this truth helps us to understand outright that God, therefore, must have a standard by which he's going to judge us. And that's important. He's going to judge everybody by the same standard the Bible teaches. You will be judged according to a certain standard from the living God. Therefore, do you see why I've relayed to you uh, that spending more time looking into this topic is exponentially important to your eternity? You're going to be judged by a standard. Don't you want to dedicate your life to learning what standard God is going to judge you by? Don't you wish that you could get your hands on God's actual standard that he's going to use on the judgment day to determine whether you go to heaven or hell, which we'll talk about in a minute, that you're going to prepare yourself? Someone says, wouldn't it be nice if God taught us specifically uh, what would cause mankind to pass the test and what would cause mankind to fail. It sure would be nice if we knew, if only God had given us his judging standard. Oh, wait. He did. Right? He gave us the standard. Every single word of it. And we're going to talk about that more in just a moment. But uh, some out there might be tempted to say, well, you know, whatever. I, I'm, I'm not interested in taking a test. I, I didn't sign up for this. So what if I fail? Um, I just won't stress out over it. And this is some people, this is how some people will go about their life. Of like, well, if, if it happens, I fail, whatever. Well, if that's your attitude, you might want to listen to point number three. Heaven is the result for passing the test. Hell is the result for failing the test. Okay, so, so, so there's some wager involved that should make this actually concerning to you about passing or failing. You should care. Uh, there's something in this that actually affects us and affects us tremendously. God has prepared both a reward, an awesome reward, an eternal reward, uh, but he's also prepared a punishment, a great punishment for the people of earth as a result and an everlasting outcome of the test. Therefore, should you care? I would. I do. Ultimately, what this test comes down to is, do you want to end up in heaven where God is at, or do you want to be away from God? Because that's where you're going to be, one of those two places, with God or away from God, after this life is over. Uh, and so it seems like a no-brainer to me. But instead of God creating you in a paradise setting with Him to begin with, forcing His love upon you, forcing you to love Him, instead, He created you 
in a platform away from him called earth as we're being tested. Though he's not far away from us, Acts chapter 17 talks about, but he put us here away from him to test us so that we could then become acquainted with him before eternity. That way we could decide if we want to go and be with God or not. It's our choice. And he, he, he puts the decision before us if we want to go to heaven or not. So if you choose God, the reward that we're told about is inexpressible. If you think that God did a good job with the creation here, and you enjoy some of these aspects, this is just the taste test that you will get the most awesome reward, uh, the best possible existence that you can think of, pure bliss and eternal fellowship with God and God's people. Uh, so you don't want to miss out on this reward. Uh, the reward alone should be enough to make you want to attain it and, and push it. But then comes the punishment. Uh, it, you know, if it were just heaven, you know, that would make you want to try hard. But then there's the other side of the coin. If you fail this test, that's a big deal. Eternally failing this test. Then the opposite is true. You thus find yourself in the worst place imaginable. Worst place you could possibly think of. It really, it's just a place without God. And it is a place of punishment for sin, for violations against God's laws, a place of torments, and it's for the haters of God place called hell. So the hell is going to be full of people who did not want to be with God. And so the question is, do you want to be with God or do you not want to be with the Creator? So you might want to rethink this if you're considering opting out or taking the test. If you're not going to try, think about that. Right? Uh, the truth is, you're taking the test whether you like it or not. You can't opt out. You can't say, well, I'm not going to take it. Well, you're on the way to failing if you don't try. So we're kind of in this boat, whether we like it or not. And one day you'll, you'll, either, you'll, you'll either die and move on to these circumstances, or while we're still alive and remain on the earth, Jesus could come back, as he said he will someday, and he'll put an end to everything on what the Bible calls the judgment day, the last day of earth's history. Jesus talked about the last day. Uh, man, mankind knows, knows not the day nor the hour of, of when this is going to happen. Uh, next, uh, so luckily we have point number four in all of this. And this is something to be very glad about. God has spoken to us, defined very clearly how to pass the test, leaving us the Bible. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 4, and verse 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, so we must understand that the life source, the ultimate help for mankind passing the test and our eternal destiny getting to be with God is found in God's Word. And he wrote, he wrote us Scripture that we can have access to. Uh, so God has spoken to mankind about how to pass the test. And you can't live without this book, without these instructions. Man shall not live by only physical bread. You need this spiritual bread. If you are alive today and you're waiting for God to speak to you from heaven audibly and vocally, uh, you're wasting your time. He's already spoken. He's not speaking again in that fashion. He's put it all in this book, written down by the hands of men, given through inspiration of God. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is by the breath of God that this Scripture was written. And it is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so we're given the scripture. And it's how God has equipped us to be successful in the judgment day. Everything you need to pass the test is just written down in scripture. So he's kind of making you work for it. Uh, he wants you to study it. But uh, God has equipped us on how to be successful in the judgment day. So if you care about it, what are you going to do? I'm going to look at that book a lot. I'm going to study that book. Everything you need to pass the test is written in Scripture. You can understand it. God says you can understand it. So God says, hey, here it is. Read it. Here's how you pass. I've given you the details. A lot of people don't open the book. Don't care to spend any time 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the Apostle Peter added, said, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All right, so you, 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 everything that you could need for the judgment day, it's in your possession. You have it. God was fair. By the way, if you're a skeptic, you know, if I were speaking to the whole world, I'd speak to the skeptics. If you're a skeptic of the scriptures that we hold in our hands today, and if you believe that the scriptures, oh man, these scriptures have been tampered with. Men have messed with the scripture. If you believe that the Bible can't be trusted as the words of God, then you need to spend more time on point number four and camp out there for a while um, and dig in. Dedicate time and, and study to find out that the Bible really is. Study for yourself. You have the right to go answer this question. Is this actually the Word of God? The Word of God given from heaven. Go, look, go see for yourself. Look into it. And one thing to add here is Jesus said, uh, my word, you know, heaven and earth will eventually pass away, but my word will not pass away. It will always be accessible. You'll always have access to it. And so that's one promise given by Jesus. But you have the right. Go read it. One thing spoken about in Scripture, uh, if you don't trust the Bible right away, and if you don't believe that it is uh, this God-sent document, the Bible says simply reading it has the power to convince you of its divine inspiration. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 is what I'm talking about. Answers the question, well, where do we get this faith? So the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the Bible itself has this claim. If you read it, it will convince you, if you want to be convinced, that it is true and that it is the word of God. Thus, if a skeptic doesn't trust the pages of this Bible, all they need to do is read it so they can stop being skeptical. Now, I don't know why so many people act like they don't want to read this book. They hear that, the, 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 oh, this is what's going to judge my soul. I don't want to open it up. Worst thing that could happen if you actually open it up and read it is that it wouldn't convince you. And then you say, well, it must not be, it's not the Word of God. At least you tried, but what's the harm in opening up the book and actually seeing for yourself? I just don't get why some people won't ever open it up and search. Right? Sometimes people with that attitude. Uh, they have that attitude not because they're truly skeptical, but because they know that if this really is the Word of God, they logically feel obligated that they have to obey it and follow it. And that's why they don't want to open up the Bible. So they know there's a standard. They're aware of their eternity. So they decide not to open it because they don't want to follow God's laws. Now they say, well, I'll be better off in ignorance, so I'm just never going to, you know, God will go easy on me if I don't know what's in the book. No. Uh, that's not really the way it works at all. You will be destroyed for your lack of knowledge and you didn't pursue God. And so they don't read the book. So what is recommended to humanity then? If I'm preaching this to all humanity, here it is. Dedicate your life to reading the scripture. Do it on your own. You listen to the preachers. Uh, make sure you're hearing sound preachers, but do it on your own, right? See whether or not these things are so. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, search the scriptures daily. The Bible says in Revelation 20 and verse 12, essentially it's the pages of the Bible that are going to judge your soul on the judgment day. John said, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. So he's seeing the judgment day. They're standing before God and it says, and books were opened. There's some books that, that God's going to open up while we're being judged. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. That has the names of, of the saved and the names, or I guess the, <coughs> deciphering the saved from the lost. And it says the dead were judged according to their works, according to the way they lived their lives, listen, by the things which were written in the books. Our God has given us the exact judging criteria for that day, the study guide. You don't have to be found unprepared. Uh, you don't have to go in blind to this final exam, final examination of the life you just lived. Yet so many people will enter the judgment day having spent so little time in the book and their very salvation hangs in the balance, but they never opened it up. You could think of the judgment day as your final examination to life's test. You'll be evaluated for the life you live. But luckily God was good hearted and loving enough to give you the study guide so that you could pass this test with flying colors if you wanted to. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, this is why we're told, study to show yourself approved unto God. Study why? 
to make sure you're going to be presented approved unto God. A, a worker. That means you're going to have to work hard at this. The New King James says, be diligent. Work hard at this. A worker who does not need to be ashamed when he stands before God because he is rightly divided the word of truth. So read it. Be honest with yourself. Let it convict you when it tells you you're wrong and you're going to be judged by this. Don't try to change it. What good is it going to do if you try to change the standard? He said in John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus said this, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And this is how it works. Point number five. I think we're starting to understand our purpose a little more. Number five, coming from Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, mankind's whole purpose is wrapped up in this phrase. It's to fear God and keep his commandments. Right, and that's Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, a great summary verse for why we're here, what's our purpose. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. So if, if you're starting to see the point of why we're here on the earth, uh, it ultimately comes down to God desiring for us to reverentially respect him and to follow his ways, or the fear of God. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 uh, says that eternal salvation is given to all who obey him keeping of his commandments, those who are pursuing obedience. Revelation 22, verses 14 through 16 says, Happy are those who do his commandments, uh, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside the city are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie, right? those who did not follow God's commandments. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you want to be my follower, then do what I say. Why do you call me your Lord and do not do the things which I say? So uh, if, you, if you seek him in his ways, you'll pass. You'll pass the test. If you don't seek him in his ways, then you don't pass the test. So what do we need to start trying to do? Study the laws of God. Look at what Jesus commanded, the apostles commanded through the Holy Spirit, and start trying to do these things. Live this lifestyle. And if we're talking about God's desire in all of this, and why he created us in the first place it involves this truth. God's desire is that a, a willful group of people who are not forced or programmed against their will to do right will desire to come and live with him. Right? He doesn't want to force his creation into heaven. What he's hoping is that you will get well acquainted with him and his ways while you're on the earth and based on us learning about him and, learn, and being introduced to God's goodness, it will be our desire, not because we are forced or manipulated, that we would desire to actually go to heaven, to be with our creator when it's all over. And I think that's what the test is all about. And God is good. God is light. Are we going to pursue goodness and righteousness and truth and love and purity to want to go to be with that? And, and, and that's the nature of God. Will you love and respect the one who put you here? Or will you dishonor him? Do you want to live life your own way, not respecting your creator, uh, sinning against the creator, and we try to do our thing? Will you honor his ways or will you uh, disobey? Acts chapter 17, verse 26, is one spot where God shows us this thought. Uh, it says, talking about God, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. God put us here. And he has determined those nations pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, right? All the countries of the earth. God's predetermined it. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So what is God's wish? All right, the one administering life's test. What is his wish? What is he after, according to this passage? That while we're living in this testing arena called earth, we will seek after the goodness of the one who created us all. He wants us to come and find him, this passage says. See that word hope? It says in the hope. In whose hope? God's hope. God wants you to come and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us. He set it up so that you'd have to do a little bit of work to pursue. I, 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 I want to be with this all righteous, all holy God. Search him out. Spend your life pursuing him. Love him. 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So I stress again, God's desire 
is that you would pass this test and get to come and live with him. Our God is a good God. Our God is a holy God. Uh, undefiled with, with, with sin, and that's essentially the definition of sin or the things that are opposite of God's nature. So, however, then, he is very serious about these violations of his law. And he's serious about you pursuing goodness and, and, and trying to live right and live according to the way God would, would be and pursuing that. If you don't pursue the way that God would, would, would do things, then you don't care about God. You don't really want to be with, with goodness and righteousness. Psalm chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says, you are, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. Those pursuing wickedness will by no means pass this test and get to dwell with God. God cannot stand the violation of his law. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 <coughs> goes further and says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That means you know, if you do find yourself on the side of God's wrath in that day, having not chosen to follow him, be very afraid. You have something to be scared of. I'd be scared if I were you, the Bible says, getting ready to meet God unprepared. You should be. Our God is a consuming fire in that sense. And one problem with people taking this test is that they're not scared enough of God. They have no fear of God. They don't take his, his laws very seriously. They don't take him at his word. That, there, that this is actually a test and that there is a, a, a reward and a punishment. They deny that this God would actually send them to hell at all, the place of fire <coughs> and torment, even though that's what he's told us he'll do. And many people are going to be surprised. Say, why, did, why would you do this, God? And he said, I told you beforehand that this is what I'd do if you lived your life this way. He has promised he will punish wickedness. If you fail, you will go to the place of torment. Rest assured. And that brings us to point number six. Breaking God's commandments, otherwise known as sin, is what will cause you to fail the test. So this is becoming more and more obvious. Uh, if God wants us to follow his commands, and that's what he wants out of us, and how you pass, then if you choose not to follow his commands, that's called sin, doesn't it make sense that the breaking of his commands is what's going to disqualify you? That's how you fail. Now Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 tells the punishment for sin. The soul who sins shall die. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's your payment. Your wages for, for sinning against God is death. Death in this eternal context is talking about eternal separation in hell. Revelation 20 and verse 14 talks about the second death and the lake of fire. And all that's in God's word. He tells you what the circumstances are. But really, here's the whole I guess you say the biggest plot twist to the whole thing. If, if, if you've been nervous up until this point, hear point number six. And where this test gets interesting is right here. Okay, God wants you to realize something. And it is that you're not going to actually pass the test without his help. It's not all on you, which, is, which you're, you should be glad about. You won't pass. You'll fail. That's the verdict. You, you're, you, you already failed. Ouch. He wants us to realize that in order to pass the test, we're still taking the test, okay? There's still a test. But you already failed. Why? You already violated God's law. You, you get the payment for sin. You're going to have to rely on him to grant you some grace here. So that you can, you can get access to pardon and the forgiveness of sins so that you can get everlasting life. Why? Because Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned already and fall short of the glory of God. That's talking about adults, people who are capable of sinning. You're not going to make it to heaven with a perfect score. There's not a chance you're going to make it that way. On life's test, you won't, you won't get 100. God tells you plainly, you know, we're trying so hard. He's too, we're trying to keep the laws and do this and that. He says, you, you're going to fail. I'm just telling you, if you're trying to do it that way only, you're done. All right, good luck. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 teaches us, there, there is none who is completely righteous, no, not one. 
ultimately righteous. Only God is in Jesus. Verse 23 follows it up by saying, uh, for uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here's what we need to get in all of this. If you try to pass the test without the mercy and the grace of the Godhead in the picture, then you'll fail. There's a component to this puzzle that you need from God to rely on so you can pass the test. And so built into this test is the grace of God so that he can can show you that this is all about, he wants you to come here. So he's going to give you a pass. He's going to help you pass. And so uh, and it's to show us how much he wants us to come to heaven. That's why he gave us this grace. So a way that mankind can have their violations against God's law eliminated and blotted out forever. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. John 3 and verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So if, if, if you've uh, been a little worried in this whole discussion, saying to yourself, man, this is, this is a scary test because I, I know I fall short of God's law. I have in the past. I will in the future. I'm just an imperfect creature. I can't do it very well. Then you need to fully understand point seven. God sent Jesus to make available the sin removal process for all your past sins and all the, the, the sins that you will potentially commit in your future. We sing the song, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. So the second member of the eternal Godhead, Jesus Christ, according to the Father's plan, came down to the earth in bodily form, walked among men, and gave himself as a sacrifice for man's sins, dying on the cross. Uh, he, he came to help you pass your test. Luckily, he was sent. So without Jesus coming, you're, you're, we're all done for. We're not going to pass. He came to give us access to passing the test. If, if you've never heard this story, and if I'm talking to the whole world, hey, if you've never heard this story, this is the story you need to dig into and learn about. It's the story of Jesus Christ. Most people have heard it. Um, but the point is, God sent Jesus so that you wouldn't have to earn a perfect score in order to pass. Uh, so I guess you'd say Jesus is your curve on this test. You know, you can't get 100, but you scored a 70 and you were faithful and you tap into Jesus' grace, you can get 100. Awesome. You can be accredited righteous. You can be accredited a perfect score. And so that's how it's going to work. Jesus came so you'd actually have a fighting chance to pass. That's called grace and mercy. Because how, how would you, without it, approach a, a holy God if you have not access the removal of your sins. Sin cannot dwell with God. You would surely fail if sin was not removed from your record. So what is needed is the blotting out of sin. Point number eight. Uh, we'll, we'll study exactly uh, how the benefit from the sacrifice of Jesus is administered. Uh, we'll use 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Oops, I went too far. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, to start here. Uh, those who do not know God, and this is a summary statement, it says, this is who's not going to go to heaven. Those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ will fail the test. Right? Thus, in order to pass, what do we got to do? The reciprocal of these two things. You got to know the God of the Bible and you got to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you do those two things, you'll go to heaven. There's a lot entailed in that. But here's what we're talking about. The gospel is summed up. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's how they were taught to obey this death, burial, and resurrection uh, in the first century. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. The idea is simple. If you will die with Christ, so to speak, putting to death your sins uh, that you previously committed and crucifying the old man of sin, your old lifestyle of sin. Put that way of life to death through repentance is the word. If you will then, after repentance, bury, be buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. God implemented baptism. Burying that old man of sin forever that you just put to death, never going back to that old lifestyle. He's a dead man. And then if you will rise up out of that water, as a new creature, the Bible said, 
ready to live that life that you've dedicated to God in faithfulness and dedicated obedience, then if you do this, if you obey the gospel, knowing the true God of heaven, you can access the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away your sin. You can get your perfect score and you'll pass. And so this becomes very important. Almost more important than the daily uh, you know, keeping of the laws. Because if you don't have access to this, the keeping of the laws don't matter. You're going to fail either way. So you need this, and then you need to keep the laws of God diligently and faithfully. Repentance and baptism will wash away your sins. Acts chapter 2, and verse 38, Peter said, here's what you need to do. Repent and have, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What you're learning here is that anyone not willing to repent and be baptized will by no means pass the test because they're on their own. This is, this is so you don't have to take the test on your own. We have to have it. The Bible refers to uh, this whole picture as the rebirth process. And in the midst of this, we're commanded to confess the name of Christ, uh, Matthew 10, 32. But the rebirth, Jesus said in John chapter 3, and verse 3, unless one is born again, a new creature, a new person, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The same old sinful you without this process cannot make it into heaven. You need to go through the rebirth uh, in, in this process. He explained further in verse 5 what exactly he was talking about. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So unless you die or buried and resurrect like Jesus Christ, you cannot go to heaven. You won't make it. You'll fail the test. Uh, this goes well with 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. 1 Peter 3, 21, where, where Peter says plainly that baptism saves us. Or Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, what's the response? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So this is how God saves mankind from their sins. And where God allows us to access the saving power of Jesus Christ in baptism, repentance and baptism. It's where God has placed the blood of Jesus so you can access it. Romans chapter three, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That's where you get the benefit of his death, through baptism. So if you're listening to this lesson, wondering if this means you need to get baptized in order to go to heaven, immersed in water, yes. I'll make a plain. You have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. Uh, but then after that, we must understand that baptism alone won't help you if you don't actually uh, plan to follow the Lord with a life of repentance after your baptism. Baptism does nothing without the repentance. Okay, baptism alone doesn't save. You must have the repentance also. A change of mind about the sin that you previously lived in uh, and then living a new life is what's required. So that's actually obeying the gospel. So a person who gets baptized only to live the same sinful lifestyle they lived before baptism has not met the conditions for obeying the gospel. You just got wet. Uh, thus, we learn that there is a condition after baptism. The Bible uses the word faithfulness. Re Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. You don't have to be perfect, but you have to be faithful. Uh, it's, it's, it's still about following the laws of God after baptism. Baptism doesn't suddenly mean you don't have to follow the laws of God anymore. Baptism is simply to get you into contact with the grace of God so that you can access it when you slip up. But Christ's blood cannot be used as a license for sin or else it will disqualify. All right? God will not be fooled. His grace will not be abused in any way. He won't let it happen. Uh, Hebrews 10, 26 says, For if we, if we sin willfully and go about sinning willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sin. I don't care that you were baptized. If you sin on purpose and you keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep... It did nothing. Okay, you won't get to heaven that way. You lose your sacrifice for sin. So there's a condition. Be faithful. Don't keep sinning willfully. Or you can lose it. There's this false doctrine known as once saved, always saved. Don't listen to it. You can be lost again, so keep the condition. Just be faithful. <laughs> But you access this through baptism. And so from the point of baptism, remember, okay, I'm still taking the test. But now I have the access uh, to, to the blood of Jesus Christ. So now, now we're talking. Now I'm going to pass. I'm taking the test, only now I have a fighting chance. And I don't have to be unrealistic with myself about my expectations. That, like I'm going to be perfect. 
I know I'm not going to be perfect. I only have to be faithful. By the way, a New Test- the, the New Testament teaches that for a baptized person, they only need to recognize that they slip up and do these three things, right? Pray to God when you slip up. Confess the sin. Repent again. This is found in Acts 8, 22, 1 John 1, 9. So the second law of pardon, some have called that. So yes, if, if this really were my only chance to talk to humanity, I probably would go about an hour. So luckily, we're going to cut this off here very quickly. But this is about what we'd be talking about if we had a chance to talk to the whole world. And so we'll, we'll go quickly through these. But th- this, this could be a lesson in and of itself. Point number 10 could be a lesson in and of itself. Look into them further. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one body is what I talk about next. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Here I'll emphasize the one church concept found in Scripture. There are not thousands of churches started by God. All the thousands of churches were started by man and not God. God started one church. Not two or three, not thousands. Jesus established one 2,000 years ago. You get in it through baptism or else perish. His way or the highway. God, you know, when Jesus said in Matthew 15, 30, 15, 13, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. you got to get in my plant. God cares that we obey him with regards to the order and operation of his church. Now, we can't just teach whatever we want in this church and call it Jesus' church. We, we can't just worship however we want. We, we can't set up the leadership however we want. We're instructed plainly in the New Testament how the church was to operate and to function until Jesus came back. And many are disobedient, starting their own man-made churches, doing things however they want. So thus, find a sound congregation of the Church of Christ near you and be sure to be part of the true Bible church. Okay, lastly, number 10 is just Satan, your enemy, tries his hardest to make you fail the test this whole time. He wants you to fail. And he's going to try to distract you by many various ways. He's going to try to make you think you're saved when you're actually not saved. That's what he does with a lot of the denominational world. And he wants to keep some people in ignorance. He doesn't want people to obey the gospel. He doesn't want people to know this. So Satan is the one out there who's actively trying to make you fail. And going back to that first one, he's trying to distract you. That's what's going on in America is that you know we have access to plenty of Bibles, but we're so drawn to our sports and our, our you know riches and entertainment and movies. He's trying to distract you away from the fact that we're taking a test, okay? So if you're listening to this lesson today, know that passing this test is the most important thing in your life. But Satan is tempting us every step of the way, trying to hinder us from passing. And Jesus said, what is a profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? There's nothing more important than passing this test. So pass life's test, enter into heaven. Choose the home with God. Read this word every single day. And if you have any need to respond, uh, please come. Obey the gospel if you haven't. Uh, And if you have any other need, don't leave here unprepared to meet your God. Uh, Please come while we stand and sing.